1. First, I need to give some background to be able to properly set the scene. I grew up in a small town in South Africa. The town is up in the mountains, so there's mostly dirt roads, dense bushes, and some forests. Our house was at quite the edge of town. The road going past our house only leads to another village. It's not that important to this story in particular. An important thing to note is that there are no street signs in this town. This means that at night time, it would be so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your eyes. First things first. Poverty is everywhere in South Africa. I'm sad to say that most of the townspeople were white people. Barring a few families, mine included. We are white and Afrikaans. My father is the DIY and handy type. So, of course, we had a lot of fairly expensive tools and things. With the town being so isolated, you couldn't get everything you needed without driving an hour and a half to the closest city. This meant that my family drove out about once a week to do our weekly grocery shopping. When we return, it's usually to a broken-in house. Usually they only stole precious clothes, blankets, pillows, and money. They left the expense of alcohol, which gave the impression that the burglars were young. The parents usually sent in younger kids, because they could fit through the burglar bars, which we had on every single window, of course. I have many stories about this, but the one I'm focusing on now happened when I was in grade 8, about 5-6 to six years ago. My mother, two sisters and I, moved to said city to attend school since my town was too small for one. Some weekends we'd visit my dad, although my parents were going through a divorce. At the time I was quite depressed, never slept at all and spent all my time reading. I had recently started reading a series and I decided to see how far I could make it before I fell asleep. I had my own room on the other side of the house. The only room in the house without burglar bars. It was only recently converted into a bedroom for my father's library and study. I felt vulnerable. So my main light was off, and I was reading with only a small lamp. My window faced the road, and there was a second gate about a hundred meters away that we never used. We had a gorgeous, albeit racist, black Labrador, Bagheera. She'd sleep outside my window. She was a loving pupper and only turned aggressive whenever someone or something that didn't belong, like a caracal or burglar, was on our property. Note, a lot of people in South Africa are afraid of black dogs, since you can't see them at night. People are afraid of them almost like they are afraid of a black cat. Here I am reading. I have reached the fourth book, and it was around 4am. I'm getting to a good part. When sweet Bagheera lets out a quiet warning woof. Paranoid and more than a little scared, I immediately switched off the light and was plunged into darkness. Everything was quiet. There was no wind that night. After a few moments, Bagheera settled down until I heard the gate being opened slowly. I'll never forget the squeaking sound as it was slowly being pushed open. Bagheera sprinted off through the intruder while I hid under my blanket. She chased him around a bit but soon ran out into the street. I lifted my head a bit as I heard the leaves outside my room rustling. My heart was pounding and I was deathly afraid. Suddenly my decision to claim the bedroom so far from the rest of my family seemed stupid and immature. Bagheera! Baba! I called softly. In response, someone shone a torch through my window. We both froze for a second, until Bagheera came bounding back. She was a barking, growling warrior, and I could hear more than one person scuffling away. I ran out of my room and to my father's room. I woke him up and told him to go look outside, please. Grumbling, he did as I asked. Bagheera immediately came inside and patrolled with him. My dad later said he'd heard people but saw nothing. So he let three warning shots off into the air to warn them to stay away. Ever since that night I've been afraid to go to sleep without burglar bars and curtains or blinds. I plan to get a gun for self-defense as soon as I'm qualified to. 2. Warning, mention of rape and sexual abuse. 
Long time snooper, first time poster. This began in my sophomore year of high school, in English class. There was this guy in my class, Craig. Craig is a slightly overweight, light-skinned guy, with an awkward sort of aura about him. I sat relatively close to him, and he was, is, friends with some of my friends. And that's how we came to know each other. At first, he was a pretty typical class clown sort of guy, acted up, didn't do his work, slept through half the class, etc. Anyway, we started working on a small group project for class, and I was partnered with him. The project was a matter of opinions, so we had to talk with each other and come up with some valid points for why we felt the way we did. After that project, we were friends, I guess you could say. He always acted flirty with me, more playful, and tried to impress me by working hard on the mentioned project. So I wasn't super surprised when he asked me for my phone number. I gave it to him, and that's when things started to feel really strange. He sent me countless flirty texts, calling me beautiful, telling me I was a lovely person, assuring me in my moments of panic and depression. Overall, he was a nice guy, but I wasn't necessarily interested in dating him. Whenever he would start to act more flirtatious, I would thank him and try to move on to a different topic. Pretty quickly after we started talking outside of school, he offered for me to come hang out at his house. Something about it made me feel wary, especially when he mentioned his parents wouldn't be home. I felt weird, but not necessarily threatened or panicked by him. I shot down the first offer, but he kept pushing it, saying we could just watch movies or play games or something. Eventually, this kind of drove me away from being his friend. I just wasn't interested in being more than friends with the guy, and it only got weirder that he started to get to know my friends. He would show up uninvited to places, where he somehow figured out my friends and I did, much to my dismay, and be his typical self. Something about him truly bothered me, and I kept trying to push it aside, just for the excuse that he was a little awkward or... He didn't really know how to approach girls. Months after I started to avoid him, ignoring his texts, asking to be moved to the other side of the room, generally darting to different places when I saw him, I found a reason for my discomfort. I had a girl in one of my classes, Laney, started to talk to me. I was really shy and in a class for freshmen because of poor grades. Despite this, Laney and I became pretty quick friends. At some point, Laney and I were kidding around about some of the guys we used to talk to or date, and I mentioned Craig. Her face went completely pale, and for once, I actually saw her speechless. And suddenly she stopped talking to me in class, in the hallway. I'd see her and try to say hi, and she would completely avoid me. Days later she gave me a note, asking for me to meet her in the art room during her lunch so we could talk. Of course, I agreed to do so. And when I got to the room, it was completely empty, besides Zlaney and the art teacher in the office with the door closed. She ended up telling me that over the summer she went to a party where Craig was, ended up smoking weed and drinking, and went to a back bedroom to pass out for a while. While she was there, Craig had come into the closed room, noticed her there and very obviously impaired and started to touch her inappropriately. She was so out of it that she started to slip into unconsciousness, but she remembers she kept saying no to him. The last thing she said she remembered was him taking off his pants. And she woke up the next morning, completely naked in the bed she passed out in, with terrible pain in her lower body. As a sexual abuse survivor myself, I told her that she should tell the police or get therapy. She said that I was one of the only people she'd told, but that she would get more comfortable with talking first, and that she would talk to someone. I said okay. She was crying by the end of it, and I ended up just hugging her there. I wish that was the end of it, but it wasn't. Now, having a legitimate reason to avoid Craig... I did so as much as possible, going as far as asking my guidance counsellor, who was a very close friend of mine at this point, to leave classes early so that I didn't see him in the hallways. The weird thing is, 
I saw him more anyway. When I would leave classes or when I would go to the bathroom or the nurse, he always seemed to be there. And he was always looking in my general direction, even trying to approach me some days. I spent two more years avoiding this guy at school, blocking him on social media, avoiding the people I used to call friends, trying to get help for Laney, etc. He never seemed to be too much of a thorn in my side, because as soon as I began avoiding him, he pretty much left me alone. Until I got into my freshman year of college. I hadn't heard from him at all. We ended up going to the same community college due to a scholarship that both of us managed to get through the high school. I saw Craig occasionally as I was darting to my classes. And in the first week of going to my classes, I got a few friend requests from people I'd met so far. One had no pictures of a person, just art as their profile picture, not wanting to come off as rude if I had met them and just not remembered their name, I added them. Occasionally they would send me supportive messages in regards to things I posted on Facebook. I said thanks and kind of moved on, not thinking too much of them. A few weeks ago, I made a post saying that if people sent me pictures of themselves, I'd draw them. The person I added requested that I draw them, and I asked them for a picture so that I could do so. I kind of leapt back, seeing a picture of Craig that was very close up of his face. It shocked me so badly that I immediately blocked the person on that page as well. I was talking with a friend at the same time. She knew about what Craig had done, and was telling her that he found me again. She immediately told me that he messaged her too, and that he was generally being a creep to her. She also blocked him on both of his pages. Thankfully, I don't go to the same community college anymore, and I've only seen him once since I blocked him again. I live in a very small town, so it's pretty common to see a bunch of people you know when you go out somewhere. I wonder all the time what would have happened if I had gone to hang out with Craig. I know it isn't super creepy compared to some of the situations here, but I felt it belonged better here than other places. So, Craig, let's not meet again. Three. To begin with, I'd like to say that I'm a male in my mid-twenties. When I was in high school, I weighed 305 pounds, but eventually lost all of my weight. Now at 140 pounds, through dedicated scheduling of exercise and eating habits. Since then, I have frequently go on a walk or jog depending on how I feel. Usually that pertains to me simply doing this activity in my neighborhood. I'm sure many can attest that doing this regularly, it can become very tedious. Going on the same route and seeing the same old scenery constantly. Like clockwork, I was getting ready to begin my workout, but I decided to change locations. On this particular day, I thought I'd head to the closest playground near my house, which is roughly a five-minute drive away. This area features a paved circular trail that is a mile in length. In the middle features the playground itself. When I arrived, nothing was necessarily peculiar. There were parents with their children and you could hear the enthusiasm from everyone. There were many parking spots filled, but I managed to find a decent spot that is close to the starting point for the trail. Next to me, however, there was an older gentleman sitting in his vehicle, watching the adults and children play. At first, I didn't think much of it, or even considered it unusual. I chalked it up as I just pulled into the parking lot, so this person was already here and probably about to leave. Either that or something else quite innocent. At this point, I'm still sitting in my vehicle, texting a friend of mine who wanted to hang out. We agreed on having dinner at Applebee's once I finished my workout. This back and forth conversation lasted approximately five to ten minutes. All the while, this male individual in his car next to me was still adamantly focusing on the children playing. His attention transfixed on their every move. From that moment forward, my suspicions and theories of who this person might be started ringing the many bells in my head. 
Within that time frame, some parents were leaving the park while others maintained their play. As usual, I got out of my car, locked my doors, and put my keys into my pocket. I turned a music playlist on my phone and set it to shuffle and began my walk. Being as the trail is a circular formation, I went counterclockwise from my perspective. When I was a little over a quarter of a mile on the walk, something compelled me to look behind me to just see. Noticeably, the remaining parents and children were now starting to leave the area. Nevertheless, the stranger that was parked next to me was still in his vehicle. Once the rest of those in the park were officially gone, leaving just me and him, the only two there, that's when this male individual decided to get out of his car. For whatever reason, he walked around to his passenger side, opened the door, and appeared to take something out and put this object in his pocket. When he closed the door, he stood there for a brief moment, looking inside my driver's side window. Of course, I knew that trouble was on the way in some form or another, and I prepared myself for what could possibly arise. Interestingly enough, the man starts walking the trail as well. However, instead of following my direction, he went the opposite way, knowing that our paths would eventually cross, unless I turned around. Truthfully, it was quite intelligent of him. He seemed to know what he was doing. Although I still had my headphones on, the music was completely muted. As we were both getting closer to one another, I took my car keys and tightly held them in my palm, with the largest key stored in my knuckles like a knife. I was quite surprised on this stranger's stature. He was fairly tall, roughly 6'4 possibly, and incredibly stocky. His attire could be perceived as a factory worker with steel toe boots and a rugged pair of jeans with a heavy denim jacket. Once we were five feet away from each other, I shit you not, he took his hand and grabbed his cock and balls and said to me, Hi, with this eerie, sarcastic expression. Thankfully, nothing violent took place. I responded with one of those little head nods of acknowledgement, but also a disgusting facial expression. I ignored his attempt at conversation and continued walking. When I was ten feet away or more, the man suddenly shouted, Hey! That had a tone of anger. I turned around and replied, Uh, yeah? He starts slowly walking towards me, smiling. Now, one of his hands were in his jeans pocket, and he asked for my name. Obviously, I lied and said, Peter. I know, I know, ironic. While he's walking towards me, I was backing up simultaneously. He then asks, How are you today, Peter? In response, I just told him, good, thanks, and continued backing away. He kept trying to insist on having a conversation. With his hand in his pants pocket and still making his way into my direction, with that strange grin, he asked, Hey man, want to smoke a joint? Let's go to my car. I have any type of drug you want. How about you come take a look and see what you want? I gave one of those sarcastic laughs in reply, also telling him, Nah, man, I'm good, thanks, though. Now I'm officially walking away from the entire scenario, and took the chance of turning my back on him. My headphones were still muted in order to hear possible footsteps, but nothing happened. I was about 30 feet away, and as I peek back, the man was still standing there. One of his hands was on his crotch again, and the other was sincerely waving at me. And yes, he was still smiling at me. When I was near three quarters done of the walk, and much closer to my vehicle, I glanced back to see where the man was. Shockingly, he was still standing in the exact same place from where our, albeit one-sided, conversation took place. Again, his posture remained in his earlier position. Afterwards, I left the park safely and rationally thought, that was a disgusting encounter, and I'll never see him again. A month or two goes by, and that day at the park had already been forgotten and put in the back of my mind. I had to go to the local grocery store, Walmart, to pick up a few items for dinner later that evening. Once I got all the necessities I needed, 
I went to the electronics department to see if there were any decent Blu-ray movies that would be worth buying. When I got to the movie section, sure enough, the mail from the park was already there. Personally, it was more than likely just a happenstance. But I made an attempt to leave that particular department without giving off the notion that I saw him. Since I was at the store already, I made my way to the complete opposite side of the electronics department to surprise my son with a new Batman toy he was wanting for a while. Somehow, minutes later, when I'm getting ready to pay for my items, the male stranger ends up spotting me. When he did, as I noticed as well, he stopped for a short moment and was gazing at me. I uttered under my breath, Ugh, fuck. I tried ignoring the entire ordeal and leave the store as rapidly as possible. Of course, all the checkout aisles were packed and busy. And since this is Walmart we are talking about, only four or five lanes were open, despite the 30 they have, but never use. I felt entirely uncomfortable, waiting in line to pay for my items, knowing that it was possible this person could get behind me, as if to wait himself. And say or do God knows what. Therefore, I took my shopping cart and trekked back to the electronic section since the person wasn't there any longer. Go figure, he started trailing me. Although we both knew we were in the store, I'm unsure whether or not he realized I caught a glimpse of him following me this go-round. Because of this, I made the decision to play cat and mouse to properly make sure he was tailing me. When I arrived at the electronic section, he too was close by. I didn't remain long in that department, and this time I went to the hygiene aisle, where the deodorant and body wash is. I actually needed a few items from here anyway, so I added a few more things to my shopping cart. Nevertheless, the man seemed to casually walk near me as if I weren't noticing. Even though he was stalking me, a part of me wanted to consider this nothing but a coincidence. This time I made a destination for the clothing aisle. Once more he was there. From here, now that I am wholeheartedly convinced the man is watching and following my every move, I took my phone out, turned the camera app on, and pressed the option to have the camera facing my direction, as if I was going to take a selfie picture. Then I propped my phone up in my cart, and tried concealing its vision, but having enough opening to see someone behind me. This time I went to the lawn and garden area. As he was following me, I was able to get a good visual on my phone, and since holidays were coming soon, this area of the store was being worked on by employees, setting up decorations and stocking shelves. Due to it being particularly busy, I managed to escape this area, maneuvering in and out of various aisles without him knowing. When the timing was right, I quickly made my way to the nearest checkout aisle that wasn't that frequented at the time. Despite the immense amount of inconvenience this man was causing me, everything went smoothly. When I got home, I looked at the footage I recorded. Obviously it was strange, but a bit humorous as well. What caught my attention was the man's demeanour in the lawn and garden area of the store. After escaping his stalking, the video captured him walking to each aisle, trying to find me, peeking down each row in hopes of seeing me. He seemed quite confused and angered by my presence not being there. Out of curiosity, I uploaded the video to social media explaining the situation I was facing with this stranger. Luckily, I had a few replies from the other locals who said that they know the person and that he's done this degenerate act multiple times before to other people one specific incident taking place at a church. Furthermore, he was registered as a sexual offender and is not allowed to be at any of the local parks in town. And if approached by the individual, be wary because he is incredibly dangerous and you should call authorities immediately. It's been a few years now since this unfortunate occurrence and nothing has happened since. Sometimes I'll get online and visit our local police website where it features a comprehensive list of current jail inmates and see if he's where he belongs. But other than that, 
things have been quite great on my end. I think it's appropriate to say, dear sex offender, let's not meet. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 190. Thanks very much to everyone who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Okay, I'm coming to you guys here at the end of a very long recording session, uh, which means I should be able to free my weekend up, uh, so I'm pretty tired, I'm going to keep the outro short. I've also got to go and actually edit the audio and make these videos. I'll be doing that for the next few hours. Okay, and with that I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves.